Welcome. I am Karen Gimnig. I am the Associate Director of the Co-Housing Association. Um, and the Co-Housing Association sponsors these web chats. As you might imagine, there is some actual cost that goes into producing them, primarily staff cost. Um, and if you're glad to have this program and willing to support it, donations could be made at cohousing.org. And that helps us keep our budget going so that we can keep offering services like this. So we encourage you to consider that. Um, we have with us tonight, Alan Ohashi. Um, and his top slide says the accidental co-houser. Alan lives at Silver Sage Co-Housing and works with co-housing groups across the country and has, I think, some of the most innovative ideas about co-housing that are being discussed. And so I'm really excited to hear from him about this one, um, having to do with where co-housing can sneak out into the rest of the community and where we can um, pour our secret sauce one of Alan's signature phrases. Um, so welcome, Alan, and thanks so much. And I will hand it over to you. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, in fact, we're having our a community meeting tonight that I'm going to be uh, a little bit uh, late for, so I could be here uh, with you all to spread the good word about co-housing. Um, but um, let's see here. First, word from our sponsor. Co the Co-Housing Association, we, you know, we don't, uh, we're not a typical nonprofit and that we don't save whales and we don't stomp out diseases, but we make the world a better place. And uh, our communities that we build, they're great places for us to raise our kids. They're hedges against loneliness and safe places for everybody to age in, among caring people. And so if you want to spread the good word about co-housing, that's the elevator speech that I use. Um, a little bit about uh, what we're going to be talking about this evening. Uh, just, uh, just sort of a brief overview of what is the co-housing secret sauce and uh, the types of co-housing. Uh, there's co-housing and uh, over time I think there, there are various uh, ilks of co-housing. Talk a little bit about the typical co-houser and maybe who is the typical retrofit co-houser. And uh, regardless of what your, your uh, community format is, uh, there are some basic minimum steps that it takes for any co-houser to start their community. And then we'll have uh, just some general discussion. Co-housing secret sauce. If you look on the Co-Housing USA website, you're gonna find these characteristics of co-housing. Relationships. Balancing privacy and community, participation, and having shared values. I won't read uh, all of those uh, to you, but uh, you know the relationships are really the core to co-housing. You know, housing is housing, but you know it's the people and it's the neighbors and everyone who lives within the community who have created this uh, this culture of sharing and this culture, this the shared vision um, in a in a, a regular co-housing, well, I guess it may be in any co-housing, it's typically 20 to 30 uh, households that translates into maybe uh, 20 to 30 or 40 people. Um, balancing privacy and community, uh, that's a, another characteristic. We all, in uh, traditional co-housing, we own our own homes generally and we can decide how much privacy we want and we can decide how much community that we want and whatever that balance happens to be during a particular moment in our lives. Uh, participation is generally something that's agreed and uh, shared decision making, uh, usually through some sort of consensus based process. Uh, there's some sort of self management and that uh, du uh, duties are shared among people. Um, you can be a commune, you can be a co-op, you can be co-housing, uh, whatever the housing configuration is, it's uh, generally uh, uh, based on some sort of uh, community participation. And I think the, the, the most important part are the shared values and community gets together and decides uh, what are their, their shared values and what is their shared story. And, uh, how you uh, walk that talk and uh, and live those uh, live those values, and here's a link that uh, will take you to the uh, 
uh, cohousing.org's page that talks about uh, the, what the cohousing secret sauce is. I live in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, we're known for beer. And so I've, if we were to break down co-housing, I think there's three kinds of uh, co-housing. There's co-housing stout, and that would be kind of like where I live, which is Silver Sage Village. Kind of regular co-housing. Uh, it's sort of partnered up. Uh, the community members are partnered up with a design professional, the real estate professionals, and you jointly develop a project. And if those of some of you may be involved in that process, and you'll know that it's very time consuming and it's very capital intensive and in that uh, everybody kind of shares the risk in developing the entire site, which gets, which includes buying the land, which includes hiring the architect, which includes uh, building the, building the project and all the brain damage that goes along with uh, city zoning and planning and building permitting and all that sort of stuff. So that's co-housing stout. Um, there's this new version that's come up that's called uh, co-housing light. And uh, this, is a, this is a version that's a little bit more developer driven where there's a real estate professional and he puts together his own project. Like I happen to know in Bloomington, co-housing in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, there's this guy named Lauren. That's what he does for his work. He builds houses and sells them. So he had a, a chunk of ground and he bought it and he is linked up with an architect. And because he's so dedicated to co-housing, he's using all the co-housing principles. In the meantime, he is also working to develop a community on the side. And the community meets, and, uh, but only they're not, uh, not involved in the, the development of the land or the development of, or the purchase of the land or any of that sort of stuff. They come and give moral support when, uh, when Lauren had to go to the, the Bloomington uh, City Council and the planning board and through all those approval processes. But it's less capital intensive. And uh, basically, the community members are responsible for their home financing. That's basically it. They move in. In fact, uh, I think in Bloomington, they're building some model homes. So people will be able to kind of come and kick the tires and kind of understand what uh, you know, what the housing is going to look like and, and how it all sort of fits together. So that's co-housing light. And then there's uh, this notion of co-housing ultralight. And that's sort of the, the nature of this discussion this, after this evening. And uh, there are a couple examples of that. Uh, this one in uh, Lansing, Michigan called Genesee Gardens. What they did was is they basically went in, a bunch of neighbors got together and they bought up some property in an urban neighborhood. Uh, they have, I don't know how many houses, maybe a half a dozen houses or a dozen houses all around the sort of central court, house, court, court area that they've designated as, as common space. They bought a, another house in the neighborhood and that's being converted uh, into, a common, into a common house. And so they all, so it meets all the criteria. They have their common space. They have private houses and, uh, but only they didn't really have to do a full development. They basically went in, bought them up as they needed to. People can kind of come in and go, people sell and people buy. And so it's a dynamic kind of uh, neighborhood there in Genesee Gardens. At the end, I'll talk about another one that's here in Boulder. That's uh, uh, another retrofit co-housing. So those are the three iterations that I think there are of co-housing. And uh, so the next thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is sort of who is the typical co-houser? And uh, these are based on data that are gathered by an organization that's a partner with the Co-Housing Association. It's called uh, the Co-Housing Research Network. <coughs> and it's uh, based out of Davis, University of California, Davis. And one of our colleagues, Karen and my colleagues, Angela Sanguinetti has done quite a bit of research on this. But uh, the, the typical co-houser in co-housing regular and co-housing light, they're typically liberal, high perceived social class, high incomes, high education levels, Caucasian, and 70% of the time a woman. And so there's, the, so this, this is the typical co-houser, you know, typ typically, you know, the whole population, it's the gender balance, for example, is 50-50. In co-housing ultralight, um, it tends to be, have some of the same demographics, it tends to be liberal, progressive, uh, more middle class people, more moderate income people still have attained the high education levels, 
but then there are also more single people and more single parents. And the reason that uh, the ultralight tends to be more diverse is because they tend to locate in diverse uh, parts of communities and uh, in some mostly lower cost areas, such as in Genesee, uh, the Genesee Gardens Project in uh, Lansing, Michigan. So as you can see, there's, you know, there's, Co-housing does span the whole spectrum, but the, the always the, the I think the challenge is is how do we uh, make co-housing appealing to everybody, but at the same time make it affordable. And co-housing ultralight is one the the one component of the three that I feel is uh, the most affordable. So then, what are the the co the steps that go into building a co-housing community? Well, there's three basic steps. It doesn't matter if you're co-housing stout, doesn't matter if you're co-housing light, doesn't matter if you're co-housing ultralight. There are these three basic steps. The first one is basically a feasibility study. And so this is where, uh, you know, you want to discuss and, and, and form your community around whatever your story is, whatever your community values are going to be. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're one person or five people or 20 people. It's, I think it's important to come up with uh, a name and identify yourself as a community and come up with an elevator speech for your community. And just referring to yourself as, oh, we're a bunch of people that are living together in a big house, that doesn't really tell about your community story. And oftentimes what I, I t in fact, I teach, I'll be teaching a class in Portland about uh, how to tell, come up with your, your community story because uh, the tendency for forming communities is to come up with the things of co-housing and the stuff of co-housing. And so you'll ask people, well, how's your project coming along? And they say, oh, well, we're stuck. For, we had a piece of land, and then the land deal fell through, and we had an architect, but then the architect, he quit us because, you know, he got tired of working for free, and then we had this problem with the zoning board. And so that doesn't, that doesn't tell me anything about your community. It tells me about uh, what you're doing with your community, but if you're trying to attract people to your community, it doesn't matter what it is, co-housing stout, co-housing light, co-housing ultralight. You really need to have a good, a good design for your, what you're telling people about who you're trying to attract. Because you're not trying to attract everybody. You're just trying to get on the outside maybe 30 people, 30 households. And so then once you've kicked that can down the road, uh, then you can start talking a little bit about what your organizational structure is going to be. It's going to be a retrofit, then it's going to be probably a co-op. It's going to be uh, uh, one like a, uh, Genesee Gardens, it's likely to eventually evolve into an HOA. But those are things that you can deal with way down the road because all states are governed by different sets of, uh, of regulations governing HOAs. And as an aside, if all HOAs and all condo associations operated like co-housing, we wouldn't have near the problems with the, with the HOAs uh, that are typically, typically are uh, uh, have high levels of malfeasance and stealing and underfunded reserves and all that sort of stuff. And that's really why a lot of these uh, HOA rules have come into, come into play. In fact, our community, we're going through our bylaws and going through our uh, HOA declarations to make them more co-housing oriented. And so uh, I, think it's some, I think that they could be model documents that could be shared with other groups. All right, so that's step one is a feasibility uh, study. The second one is developing budgets. Doesn't, again, it doesn't really matter if it's going to be a full-blown full, full co-housing development and co-housing stout. It doesn't matter if it's going to be a co-housing light. It doesn't matter if it's going to be co-housing ultralight. You still need to think about uh, a budget. Think about uh, what this might cost you down the road. So, for instance, there's a group that, I, that I'm uh, – uh, talking with in Traverse City, Michigan. And uh, <coughs> what they're doing is they're kind of creating their community before they start looking around for a place. In fact, their mission is to find, they have a, their eye on a, a, a retrofit, uh, a, maybe, I think maybe it's a, a mental health uh, place in Traverse City that some guy has been, um, I guess, um, retrofitting and turning into apartments and, and shops and coffee shops and all that sort of stuff. So their idea is to uh, move their project into uh, this uh, retrofitted uh, mental health hospital. And 
they're forming their community right now. And so what they're doing is they're talking about, well, are we going to have any expenses for common meals? Are we going to have any expenses, like, for instance, if we're going to go on a field trip? Are we going to do any kinds of community service as kind of our higher purpose or as, or as our mission? So at the ultralight level, you know, there are still budgets that are going to be necessary. And same thing with, uh, with co-housing uh, light. You're going to have to try to figure out your own finances, although a lot of that's going to be borne by a lot of the common finances are going to be borne by the developer. And we all know about developing budgets for uh, co-housing stout, where we sit around the table and try to figure out how much we're going to spend on tile or how much we're going to spend on uh, plush rug or hook rug, loop rug. So budgets, that's step number two. Third step is design and construction. So again, it doesn't really matter if you're building co-housing stout. That's uh, obviously there's a huge amount of design and construction that goes along there. Co-housing light, there's a big amount of construction that goes on with that, although the community is not so involved with it. And even with co-housing ultralight, there's gonna be some, some design and some construction, particularly if you're doing a retrofit. Like for example, in Genesee uh, Gardens in, in Lansing, Michigan, they bought the one house that they're using for a common house and they had to do some renovations uh, to that place. And if you're gonna be in an apartment house or if you're gonna be a bunch of units in an existing HOA, it's a matter of designing worth, what the common areas are gonna be. Are our common spaces gonna be within existing houses? Are we gonna be able, are we gonna use common spaces that are in the existing uh, development? Uh, how, are those, how are those going to function? So there's design and construction in all, in all types of co-housing. All right, let's see here. I lost my screen. And here are some examples of co-housing ultralight. Now there's one that's called Beacon Hill that's in uh, North Boston, Massachusetts. This is taken from the website. And it's basically people living in their houses. I think there's uh, maybe 500 people in this, uh, in this village. And they all kind of live within sort of the same area uh, on the north end of, of, of Boston. And it's, uh, it's uh, membership driven, so you have to pay money. So there's a budget. And they work together as a group. They come up with programs and services. And uh, it enables them to basically age in place within their own homes and in their own neighborhoods. But they don't have to go to a, they don't have to live in the same building. They live kind of dispersed in the same, in the same uh, general neighborhood. They have uh, share rides to the store. Someone needs a ride to the doctor. Or someone needs someone to go pick up their, their, uh, their prescriptions. And they have joint activities. And so they may all go to a movie or there may be a group of people who goes to, goes into town and, and uh, goes, to the, goes to Fenway Park. So that's the uh, uh, Beacon Hill Village modeled in Boston. And this is another one here in, in Boulder. Um, there's this guy named Greg Sherwin. He bought 17 uh, condos within a 360 unit acre, unit uh, kind of condo complex called Gold Run. And uh, so basically people rent, some people can buy from them. But nonetheless, it's this community that, that Greg has built. And so the, the beauty of this is uh, the, the owners, the, the members, they don't have to worry about when they're going to fix the roof. They're not going to have to worry about when they paint the outside of the building. They get to do all the fun stuff, like all the community things. They get to do the, the common dinners. Uh, they, Greg told me that they had a, a, a community service project where the HOA or the master HOA bought all the materials and the community, the Boulder Creek community, redid the park, did some work in the park. So this is a, a, a community within a larger HOA. And uh, so that's another configuration. And the third one I bring up is the Big Bang Theory. Everyone watch the Big Bang Theory on television? I don't know, maybe not. Well, anyway, there's this apartment building and there are these four, a bunch of scientists live in this apartment house in California and uh, they share meals. They share activities, they decide things on consensus, and they have a common space. And uh, if you haven't watched the show, the elevator has been out of function for the whole 11 seasons, I think. And so their common space ends up being 
the stairwell from the bottom floor up to the floor where their where their apartments are. And so they share conversations, and that's kind of where they hang out and and uh, bond with one another in a common space, other than common spaces. Although Big Bang Theory or Friends or Seinfeld, all those have kind of the same same sort of uh, format. And it would be co-housing if they decided they're going to they're actually going to intentionally name themselves or whatever. But anyway, this is how that's that would be one that would be a clearly accidental. Uh, co-housing. Uh, let's see, what else? Now what? So you get all fired up, you get all ready to go. It's like going to church camp, you get all rah-rah at the end, and then you go home, and it's uh, back to the day-to-day -day grind. And what did that guy tell us about the retrofit co-housing? Well, so the idea is, is to keep your, keep your co-housing juices flowing and uh, keep your creativity and of uh, moving forward and uh, getting your group together and keeping work, keeping uh, your meetings going with your groups. And uh, at a minimum, just kind of go through that outline and jot down a couple sentences about uh, uh, your feasibility study and your budgets and your design and slowly expand out that outline into uh, as you start developing uh, and as you start attracting people. So what do I say? If you uh, want to still stay jazzed up, it's a long ways out yet. It's attend the co-housing conference in uh, Portland. It's the end of uh, May and the beginning of June. And uh, it's a great place to hang out and to network with people. And if you're still stuck, I am, I am so dedicated to this, this, this retrofit thing. I'm willing to work with your, you and your group and coach you either through Zoom or face-to-face -face or do whatever I can to help you get your groups going. Because here's the, here are the other data. There, in the whole United States, in the whole North America, there's maybe not even 200 communities that are, that are occupied and functioning. And then there's a few, a, bunch, a whole bunch of them that are kind of in this formation stage. And so the other data are, based on some of those research done by uh, the, the Causing Research Network, is there's a high level of, of uh, acceptance for the co-housing idea and a high level of excitement and, and uh, interest in co-housing. But on the other hand, it's not co-housing is not accessible. And so it ends up looking like that uh, it's this thing that's for rich people, it's this thing for only for white people, it's this thing for, uh, for only liberals that, are, want to, that uh, you know, are afraid the planet's gonna blow up because of uh, global warming. And so there's this sort of stereotype of co-housers that doesn't that doesn't really tell the whole story about the breadth of co-housing and the interest that there is in co-housing and so i i think that for this to really get off the ground people people really need to think about how do i how do i get into this or how do i at least form a community uh to function maybe like like beacon hill beacon hill village or how can I pal up with my neighbors who already live in the existing condo complex or apartment house and form a community community there? Because as we all know, it's very expensive and time consuming to build co-housing stout. So I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying co-housing light's bad or good. I'm not saying that uh, ultralight is good or bad. Co-housing is co-housing. And it's a matter of just finding your niche, finding where you fit in best, and uh, not be kind of wedging yourself into a certain co-housing uh, genre because it's the secret sauce that makes co-housing, and that's that's uh, that's the bottom line. So, how long did I talk? Twenty minutes. You're great. Thank you. So, anyway, um, any questions or comments or? I'm here to help you. <laughs> I want to get you to get to get your communities started and uh, and 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 uh, growing. So I'll ask one: if if I'm a person who's interested in this idea, but I'm just me, right? I just have I'm just where I am, and I'm like, oh, that sounds great. It's less expensive. I think I could get into it. I didn't, you know, that sounds like a great plan. What's the first thing I should do? 
Um, you know, the, the idea is, is that co-housing really is, you know, working with people who you get along with and who you like and who kind of have the same, uh, same uh, I guess, goals in life. And uh, it's talking, I think, talking to your friends and family, friends and relatives, friends and neighbors when you're uh, at, at church. Uh, I know because, you know, people are talking. This is on people's minds, maybe not co-housing necessarily, but God, who's going to take care of me when I get old? And uh, I posed that question on the Facebook page and uh, there was like 2,000 responses, right? Well, it ranges all the way from, hmm, nobody to, hmm, maybe my daughter will move, will, will take care of me. Hmm, I don't know. And so if, if, if that, I think that is probably the, the, the biggest, I guess, fear maybe. I don't like to use fear, but the basic sort of planning ahead item that uh, that people have in terms of um, what am I going to do when I can't uh, take care of myself anymore? And you know, usually it gets to be when you, you, if young people, for example, don't start thinking about this until they they get a call from mom saying, "I fell down and I can't get up," or uh, they open up their 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 mail and there's the AARP uh, flyers, and so it. It's something that I don't think people really want to think about, but you know what? Co-housers don't even want to think about it. And in fact, that should be kind of a, one of the visioning things that all farming communities should do. I should add that into the, into the presentation about what do we, how do we, how, do, how is this place going to look 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Because here we are, we're 10 years uh, under our belt and we're a senior co-housing. And so everybody who is 50 is now 60, everyone who's 60 is now 70, and we've got people who've been dying, we've got people who've been uh, you know, moving out because uh, they're unable to live here anymore. And so how, are we gonna still be able to garden? Garden? Are we gonna still be able to shovel the sidewalks? Are we still gonna, is my, is my last deathbed thing going to be, oh man, I wish I would've gotten to one more common house dinner. I wish I would've gotten to one more meeting. No, that's not going to, I can tell you that we're already having people having those thoughts here, and that's not on the radar screen. Being in the community. They're out traveling. We have people who are off campus for months at a time, weeks at a time. I'm leaving that next, I'll be gone for two weeks in May myself. And so who picks up that slack when there isn't anyone around to do the work? So it, it's this idea of, of, uh, Taking care of yourself, but at the same time, how do you do it together? How do you be not lonely together? Great. So I ask think... your friends. Ask Shelly to be in your community. <laughs> oh, she is in your community. As it happens. Um, so Floor has a hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Hello, Floor. So I've met you in uh, the co-housing conference. How are you? She's muted. She is muted. She was unmuted a minute ago. Maybe she had to go she get it. She put a, something a in the chat. Said, are you familiar with the Lilac community in England with different income level, each commit to spending 30% of income for <coughs> housing costs? No, I'm not familiar with that. And that's uh, truly more of a shared economy type uh, of co-housing and uh, something that is probably less prevalent or less prevalent here. I do know that uh, Yana, uh, Ludwig up in La Laramie, Wyoming has kind of a shared economy uh, community that she's starting up there. So it's not unheard of. Uh, but um, I think ultimately what that, what that is, is that sort of a, a tithe, tithing to pay for common expenses as opposed to, you know, going through the budgeting process. And in a lot of ways, I think maybe the 30% might be a lot easier to figure out in that, you know, Around here, we're having all these big arguments about, uh, okay, well, these 2,000 square foot units, and then we have 800 square foot units, and arguing over how we figure out who gets assessed what, and one person uses more water than two people, and one person lives in a 2,000 square foot house, and two people live in an 800 square foot house, and there are all these sort of weird uh, non sequitur discussions that, we're, that we have in you know, developing our budgets. But, you know, I don't know if you'd run into that problem in a retrofit co-housing thing. I'm seeing another question. In your co-housing community, Silver Sage, keeping elders at home when they reach the stage of needing assistance? 
You know, we had a, I was one of those actually. That was, in fact, this is why I'm on this crusade of co-housing. I got dragged down the block 600 feet to co-housing and I really sort of knew what it was, intellectually kind of got co-housing. But it wasn't until I got sick in 2013, flat on my back, left for dead. And uh, luckily the University of Michigan figured out what was wrong with me and here I am. And it wasn't until then that I realized, you know, what the secret sauce really was. It was the neighbors coming over and, and visiting. It was the, the neighbors gathering up a, 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 a pool of money to pay for transport costs and that sort of thing. And so it's not like, of course, this is all co-housing. It's not like, call me if you need something. And co-housing is like, what do you need now, right now? And I'll come do it for you. you need a jump? I got jumper cables. You're in the hospital. I'll stop by when I'm out doing my errands. So it's it's um, it, it, we, I was one of those one of those uh, homebound people, and uh, my next door neighbor over here, Jean Kroll, she uh, has had Alzheimer's for the last eight years and has had to move out into a nursing home for the last two. But yet, I others we go up and visit Jean. She, uh, I don't know if she, I'm sure she knows we're around. Uh, she's been there, uh, thankful, thanks to the community, I think. She's been hanging in there for like two years. And she was here for two years, and I think she would not have been able to stay here for two years had it not been for the community wa kind of watching after her and Henry, her husband. So, yes, did that, did that answer your question? No, I posed the question. <laughs> So, Alan, it's good to see you. Thank you for your yeah. presentation. Okay, thanks. Thank you for your presentation because I've been wrestling with this whole thing about aging and community for quite a while, as you know. We uh, completed a 17-month-long a inquiry into aging in community and specifically in co-housing. And uh, one of the things that uh, came out of that was that uh, we're very good in co-housing, at least in my community and the communities I know. We're very good at helping people who have acute uh, health requirements and needs. We're very good at that. Uh, we're very good at short-term intensive uh, needs, even those that uh, lead to, uh, to death. What we're not good at is long-term chronic care. And that's the piece. So when you say, uh, you know, let's get together with our neighbors or let's form a co-housing community, um, I think the issue is not, as long as we're healthy, this goes to your friend who's in the nursing home, um, as long as we're healthy, I think we do really well in co-housing or healthy enough, let's say, we're able to take care of us, we do really well. But it's when we get to that chronic um, stage, which we call, which I've been calling, um, deep, deep aging, the place between healthy aging and death. It's that, that ground there that we don't do very much, we are unable to handle. And it's interesting, you know, what happens in your community, because you're a senior community, you have one person in a nursing home. What happens when half of you are in a nursing homes or three quarters of you? This, you know, this has happened, I uh, can't remember the name of the community in Oregon, the you know, they were 80 years old when they formed their community They're, and they just simply have been dying out. So anyway, you understand uh, this, is, this yeah. is what I'm looking for. And, and I think that uh, in retrofit co-housing, there would be a better opportunity to, to like make, uh, I guess, uh, wait, make room for, for that um, because you could set up in a place that was nearby services. And you could set up into in places that are uh, you know more accessible, as opposed to you know building a you know a ten million dollar housing complex that's out in the middle of nowhere because that's where you can afford the land and you're isolated you're isolated away, and uh, you know, that's something that we are concerned about. We have right now we have five five units. We just sold five units that are turning over. Four people are uh, sort of aging themselves out. To go move into uh, uh, CCRC uh, uh, in uh, South Boulder, and um, that's a continuous care retirement uh, community, and uh, they have a they have the wherewithal to do that, and b they're uh, 
they want to go to a place where they can be in an independent living now and assisted living and um, the nursing home eventually afterwards. And so what I see is co-housing as being, as being kind of uh, the gateway drug to, uh, to aging. Because I, I, I know of, uh, of my partner, Diana, her mo- she moved her mom out here and uh, lived in uh, uh, an assisted living south of town. And I would go over there from time to time to visit. And there were some of these residents who were just kicking and screaming that they were taken out of their, their homes and they lost their individualism and lost their, their, uh, their privacy to live in assisted living. And, uh, and uh, there just were problem, problems for the whole, for the management and all that. But if it's, what if they started out in co-housing and they understood that you could still be by yourself and you could still have privacy and you could still have community as much as you wanted. I'm, I'm, all, I'm all over moving to an assisted living. I'm ready to go whenever I have to go. And I think the co-housing has gotten me ready for that. And I'm not going to feel like I gave up any of my privacy. I'm not going to feel like uh, that's going to be problematic. I'm not going to feel like I lost my independence. You know, my dad, lo- I remember when my dad had to give up his car keys. That was the worst time. That was the worst day of his life. And I can't wait to give up my car keys. On the other hand, I can't wait till I have to have someone drive me around. So uh, I don't know if I'm still talking around your question. And we, yeah. in short, in short, we have ta- we are not going to have any kind of caregiver move in. Uh, just because of licensing and all that kind of stuff. But we have talked about having someone move in who would be the guy who would uh, go to the grocery store for you. Or if you needed uh, you know, a light bulb change and you can't climb up a ladder to go do that, kind of a, 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 care, a, a caretaker, but maybe would have some basic uh, uh, first aid skills. But nothing that would be – in fact, we even talked about t- turning our downstairs basement into um, you know, like a – a rehab facility, a rehab room, which it's still, which it sort of is, and then have caregivers come in. So uh, I think that uh, short of having a live-in care, live-in professional caregiving, uh, I think we we're set up pretty well for um, ancillary care. Well, I think Ellen, can I ask you a question? Sure. So, well, first, thank you, thank you for. This web chat, thank you, Karen. And it was so good to meet you at the last um, national yes, conference. Yes, Nashville. Yes. Yeah, in Nashville. I hope I can. I could see you again this time in Portland. I wanted to ask you. Um, I don't know if you've seen the this ad that it's um, that it's from the Canadian government. That's uh, it's hashtag Eat Together. And it's about um, an apartment building where people are all alone in their single apartments. And a couple of girls, they just pull out their tables and they have a dinner at the stairway. And all the neighbors start um, coming and joining for dinner. Do you think that um, hosting a sort of a common dinner or asking for uh, current neighbors in an apartment building could help um, bringing or building little by little that, that sense of community in case you cannot move into eco housing. Right. And I think that's, you know, kind, of, kind of the is, idea is that you would be able to, uh, to organically create a community. And so the, the, the I shared a link of a, of a, Story that I wrote and there was a case in Flushing, New York, where a couple moved into an apartment, a uh, uh, rent restricted uh, apartment in Flushing, New York, and they attract, started to attract their friends. It reminded me a lot of the Big Bang Theory. And they had attracted their friends into this uh, apartment house and uh, the, the, the typical, you know, the guys, they like to play games and women, they like to go to the movies and, you know, they, they shared meals and and I think that that uh, functions as co-housing, but uh, I think for it to actually be co-housing, they would have to say, okay, we're going to have some kind of structure to our, to our lives. And uh, we're going to, we are going to care, care. We're going to have this sort of a credo amongst ourselves that we're going to take care of each other or whatever. But I think, at, but at a minimum, I think that that's something like that would function as co-housing, but I think that for, for it to be truly co-housing, really would need to have the four characteristics somehow. And it sounds, and it could be de facto, 
but then maybe they could figure out a way to, to write those things down and agree upon them. So Alan, we have some questions piling up in the chat here a little bit. So one is from Oak Creek Commons. <coughs> we are 15 years old with half being original people and half being new with less connects. Um, how do we keep the juices flowing between old and new? Well, you know, we're doing, going through that right now ourselves. We have five new uh, residences. We're at our community meeting. We have one that just uh, closed and we have another couple that are thinking about moving in and they're just kind of kicking the tires tonight at the, at the meeting. And so it's, I think it's just, I think it's just a matter of just doing what you're doing, but being welcoming to uh, the new synergy. Uh, we've turned over, I would say almost, I'd say that out of 16 units, there are three original founders who are still here. And, uh, a couple of those units have turned over twice since uh, since the community has started, and so I think it's a I think it's a matter of of uh, just being welcoming and open to new ideas, and uh, turning uh, letting loose of control. I think that's the the main thing that uh, that is the founder syndrome is is uh, trying to keep things. Oh, this is how we've done it in the past. This has worked in the past. We don't need to change. Everything is is just fine. But then that doesn't, that stifles, that's very stifling onto the new people because I was one of those new people. I'm usually the kind of guy who jumps right in, the chronic overachiever, wants to try a little bit of everything. But man, when I came here, I had to really dial that back because, you know, we, we, we don't do it like that. We, this is, a, this is this guy's job and this is what this guy does and this is what this woman does. And, uh, you know, we're not ready to let up those let the, those things up but now you know I'm feeling like my time is sort of finally coming after five years or ten years my time is finally here and um, and so I'm gonna feel much more comfortable uh, participating but I think that in the case of uh, of your place of, uh, of Oak Creek Commons you know fight that urge to keep things the way that they have been especially if you're going to be having a bunch of new people come in and because there's only, you know, there's many ways to get to the same place. And so it's just a matter of trying some different ways to get to that same, the, to the same end game. So I suggest you give up control and be open to new ideas. Thank you. Next question. Could local governments and organizations like VNA help financially to build retrofit co-housing neighborhoods. This would give neighborhoods the incentive to create more sustainable neighborhoods where everyone could age in place. What is VNA? Uh, Visiting Nurse Association. Okay, there's a uh, group that's called ALCA, and I gave, a, gave this, I've ta let's tell this, talk to anybody who wants to hear it. I was in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts, and spoke to the American Life Care Association, who are basically mm -hmm. care managers and social workers. And there's a woman in Gloucester who is trying to do that. They're trying to uh, build an assisted living that has co-housing secret sauce. So the mm -hmm. idea is it ends up being less top-down, less management-oriented, and more, I guess, resident-centered, I guess what it would be called, or patient-centered, patient-driven. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is it gives more responsibility to the, to the uh, community members or the residents uh, mm -hmm. Than, uh, than it is in a typical assisted living or a typical nursing home. So yes, there are possibilities for that. And it's just a matter of finding one. Mm -hmm. I, just gave, I just pitched Boulder Housing Partners over here. They do a lot of uh, senior living and you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to get them. You know, it's like this, it's like this a nursing home industrial complex. And, mm -hmm. and it's hard to really break into it unless you kind of start with something on the ground floor. So yes. Uh, something mm -hmm. like the VNA would be a perfect organization to help spearhead something like that. And uh, maybe even some of the, the nurses and uh, caregivers would live there and, and uh, be able to take care of each other, I suppose. Right. Yeah. I live in um, Burlington, Vermont, Burlington co-housing. And there's another organization that's throughout the state of Vermont called Cathedral Square. And I, um, about seven, eight of us who live here at Burlington Co-Housing and are aging over age 65, we've joined uh, SASH, Support and Services at Home, which is, um, you know, works in cooperation with the VNA. 
So we do have a lot of assistance here. And I think, you know, we'll be able to age in place easily. Of course, we're right across the street from hospital too, <laughs> but it's a very convenient um, place to, to age in place. Um, but we also, we want to be multi-generational with family members too. And what's nice, I think about the VNA is that they cover all age levels, you know, birth through death. So. Yeah, I'd say that's a, that would be a, a, a great uh, idea to try. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> so Ellen, there was a request. Um, could you speak to the experience of N Street co-housing? They seem to have addressed most of these concerns. You know, I've just heard of N Street uh, co-housing. Um, they were there in San Francisco, seems like, or California. Oh, yeah. uh, they're in or Oregon or, oh, maybe they are in California. They Somewhere. might be Oakland. One Oakland. In, Oakland. Uh, they're not in, oh, Chicago, maybe. Chicago, Minneapolis or maybe. Chicago. Yeah, I'm not sure of the particulars of uh, N Street, although they're like one of the oldest retrofits out there. Mm. Um, but no, I can't speak to any particulars about that, but you know, whatever it is that they did, it seemed to uh, work out. And I think, in, and also, you know, in this day and age, it's that, you know, things are just, housing is just nuts right now. And uh, whoever got into this 10, 20 years ago, it's, you know, we're, yeah, we're, it's in, we're lucky. <laughs> it's in Davis, it's in Davis. Davis, California. Davis, California. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I think that's all the questions on the chat. Alan, do you have any final thoughts? Um, no, other than um, I think this is there somehow there's going to be a tipping point of, of co-housing and it's going to, and I think it's going to come because of, of a combination of all three types of co-housing. But as far as the, the type that's going to result in the fastest, develop, fastest growing communities are going to be in retrofits. And um, just because it's, it's less, cost, less, less capital intensive and uh, less brain damage. And you know, like I say, it's just the secret sauce is what makes your community. And you don't have to be stewing over a piece of ground or you don't have to be worried about uh, we're going to be able to have an architect right away and all that. The main thing is to kind of come up with this, the illusion of your community at least by having a, a your story on paper and building out what your outline is going to be and having a Facebook page, <laughs> you know, just have kind of the, the idea of your, of your community and you'll be surprised at the, at the, at the attraction that that will, that that will bring. And like I say, you know, if you, you know, you'll, click the leave meeting and you'll go home and uh, wonder now, okay, well, he said some great stuff, but I can't, I don't know where to start. And so I, I would, um, you know, download the slides. There's, and, and that just gives a very simple approach to doing this. It's not complicated. Three steps, three steps of uh, developing your, what the basis is for your community and, and get a couple of friends together. Be pioneers. <laughs> Be pioneers. Be pioneers. I like it. All right. Well, we are nearing the end of our hour, so I will go ahead and close us out. Um, as Alan said, there is a conference coming, and I would encourage you to register soon. I think we're coming up on the end of the early bird time. Um, so discounts available if you register in the next week or so, I think double check the website for that date. Um, and, um, and also go ahead and make your hotel reservations. Um, those are actually, we're running out of those faster. Although our executive director, Karin has been doing some magic to find some other solutions there, but go ahead and register. If you think you want to go get your hotel, sign up for intensives and tours. Those will fill, we think. Um, so the availability will change out um, what, what's available on particularly those intensive days, the last two days of May. So encourage you all to do that. Alan, do you want to say anything about how much fun it is to go to conference? Um, the co-housing conferences are, are really great. They're, and, and as we have been talking about today, it's all about the people. And so you don't ever hear about uh, 
the cul-de-sac housing association having national conferences, right? You don't. And you only hear about the co-housing association that has a housing conference. And we don't talk necessarily about housing, but we talk about uh, how we care for each other. We talk about how we uh, cook meals for each other and how we are uh, present for each other. And, and, oh, yeah, we do have architects and we do have builders there who talk about uh, some of the, the, the nuts and bolts of co-housing. But it's a matter of getting to talk to Anne Zabaldo and getting a chance to uh, talk to Floor and uh, just people from all over the place. And, you know, here we are getting to, you know, reconnect on uh, on Zoom chat. So I encourage everybody to come to the co-housing conference. It's uh, not only informative and it's a great place to meet great people, but it's also a lot of fun. Uh, we have uh, share lots of uh, information and stories and war stories and um, just trying to make the world a better place one co-housing community at a time. I'm looking forward to it too. I think it will be a good time. Speaking of architects, next week's web chat, which is Wednesday, March 6th, Grace Kim will be with us. Um, and she's going to talk about common house acoustics which is probably a topic of interest to anyone who has a common house. <laughs> yeah, how about talking about uh, acoustics from upstairs people in any co-house <laughs> or any condo complex? You can, you can bring your other acoustics questions for Grace. <laughs> um, but she'll be with us Wednesday, March 6th for, for our next web chat, and we hope to see you all there. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Alan, for a great Thank presentation. You. And yeah, thanks we'll for coming. We'll see you, see you all around. And get with me if you want if you really want to do this. Sounds uh, great. Thanks, Alan. Good night, right. everybody. Good night. Hi, thank you.